We spoke about the sort of unexpected, well, should have been expected, but wasn't expected events of 1391, where there was this huge spontaneous outbreak of uh, violence, all started in one place and spread like wildfire to the other, all over Castile and Aragon. We're looking once again still at this map, right? This is Spain at that time, meaning there was no Spain. There was still a collection of kingdoms. This, of course, is Portugal. It doesn't count so much, but it sort of does. But the, what will become Spain is this and this. Castile, Aragon, right? And uh, the, the, the riots began here in Seville and then spread like that and then spread like that all over the place. They didn't go here and they didn't go there, but if you were unfortunate enough to live in that area over here in Castile and Aragon in uh, the period of 1391 and, 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 and immediately afterwards, it was the wrong time to be Jewish. And as we saw, what resulted was a huge number of Jews, um, sometimes through no fault of their own, sometimes through fault of their own, uh, converted. And that's the bottom line. And uh, this led to the law of unintended consequences. As I pointed out, the church and no one was prepared for such a large number of uh, converts and they simply had no infrastructure uh, to absorb them. And uh, the people who did convert ended up living in the same neighborhood. As I said before, you still live next to the Aguda, so to speak. And they ended up um, being in a situation where uh, they're still very Jewish ethnically. Right? Whatever happened in their particular religious uh, past, as I told you before, one brother was unfortunate enough to be walking down Park Heights and that's where the mob hit. The other one was walking down Greensburg, that it happens to be not where the mob hit, based on uh, vagaries of chance and things like this. Uh, members of single families found themselves uh, in a situation where some had become converts and some not. And so it wasn't a matter of uh, somebody being persuaded or, uh, you know, a movement among families towards the baptismal font. It happened in a disjuncted and violent and sort of unplanned way. But after 1391, as I showed you, hopefully, uh, hopefully you remember, there they began a period of very intense follow-up by individual charismatic preachers, uh, right? And uh, the result was that uh, enormous pressure was placed on Jews all over the place in the 1390s and down till around, for another 30 years, pretty much, down to the middle of 1410s, you know, like 1416, 1417, 1418, those period uh, when it began to abate because of the death of the main villains who were leading the uh, huge fanatical uh, conversionist mobs. But you can't say that they were fanatical. I mean, they succeeded, as I said before, at the end of the day, when a mob would show up in front of a show like Hertzberg's or the Agut or anywhere else, because that's what happened, and everybody got scared, and a ton of people convert. Well, it worked, so why not keep it up? You know in other words, success rewarded these uh, efforts, which really were a combination of carrot and stick. And so, uh, you know, if I'm standing in the room, this is the effect of it. If I'm standing in the room with a huge loaded gun, and I say, I really advise you to do this, even though I don't have to actually put it up to your head and say, if you don't do this, I'll kill you, but the, but the threat is there. You understand? And halacha, by the way, this is a famous debate between the Marik and the, and the Beis Yosef, whether if there's a an uh, unstated threat of violence is that considered uh, a duress and things like that. Well, in Spain it sure was. And so by the time you get to the early 1400s, even when it sort of abated, when uh, the leading conversionary friars uh, died in the late 1410s, when uh, some of the leading Mishumarim, uh, like Pablo de Santa, Maria, uh, de Santa Fe we talked about last time, and people like that, when, when they died, again, late, when that pope or that anti-pope uh, Benedict, when he died, uh, when a lot of these uh, main villains, uh, when they kicked the bucket, so then the things quieted down. Plus, um, it so happens that at that time, particularly in Aragon, and to a lesser degree here, uh, strong kings and queens came on the throne. And uh, when that happened, then obviously there was a sort of reassertion of law and order, and that's what the Jews always desperately needed. Right. Remember, uh, we've said over and over again, the Jews survive to whatever degree they survive because they rely on a strong government uh, which practices law and order, and that government allows the Jews to be there because the Jews are perceived in their economic interests. I mean, that, that was the name of the game in the Middle Ages. There was no pretense on anyone's part that Jews are here because of uh, liberalism or tolerance or things of that nature. Neither side expected that. But at least pragmatism should govern the uh, safety of the Jewish population and so from around 1421, roughly speaking, uh, for the next couple decades, there were no 
uh, movements, again, of the type that I just described, uh, they never actually arose at all. Uh, from time to time, you would have incidents here and there because the priests and the church were always heating things up, but uh, the kings pretty much kept law and order, so uh, you're going to have riots here and there as you go through the 1400s. In this place, a Jew was accused of uh, what they call desecrating the host, you know, attacking the sacred bre bread and, and the wine in, in, in the mass. And in other places, they may be accused of kidnapping a kid. In the third place, uh, if somebody dies suddenly, they might say the Jews poisoned them, and there might be some kind of temporary outbreak of violence. But usually what happened in those individual cases are that the police and the army, so to speak, intervene. And uh, that doesn't mean things are great, but it means that you didn't have the situation that was there from 1391 to approximately 1420. So today I'm going to be looking at the last period of year from 1420 or thereabouts till 1492, the, the expulsion, because we all know what the end is, even without me telling you. The uh, mass conversion of these uh, Muranos as they call them Romney's pigs, uh, or conversos, or in Hebrew we call them the Anusim, the ones onus, from fo who were forced, uh, as they say before, had all sorts of unintended consequences. Uh, first of all, um, like I told you last week, now you've got to let the Jew in the country club. Right? Uh, this meant that uh, Jews were able, to, people who had been Jewish, and now are Christians, whether they really are or aren't, and they all really were Christian, the only thing is how much do they believe it, some do and some don't. That's a machlokis till today among the historians, how many and how much did people believe things. But then they were open for all the offices of the state. In the old days, uh, Jews could never be a secretary of state, secretary of defense, and all that sort of thing. The position of Jews in the governments was always that of an al Sharif, basically the guy in charge of the taxes, uh, the uh, money, I mean, literally minting the money, things of that, of that nature. That's, so to speak, a Jewish job. But, uh, you know, officials like a mayor of a city, member of a city council, which are very hush of positions in the Spanish society. Um, people, obviously, when they were Jewish, never intermarried with the aristocracy or the other big shots. And uh, obviously, people who are Jewish in numbers never occupied any kind of significant positions within the church hierarchy. And now, of course, they do, because there's a ton of them all over the place. And a lot of these people came from families and backgrounds, and they themselves had these kinds of talents, which... Uh, in a meritocratic situation would allow them to rise in society. Well, then you have the old problem. All the doctors are Jewish, all the lawyers are Jewish, all the this is Jewish, all the rest is Jewish. You, know, you, you come full circle. That's not what the Spanish had in mind. The answer is nobody had anything in mind. They just wanted to convert them. They didn't think about what will happen the day after. And now they had to face the consequences of what happens the day after. And uh, naturally, there begins to uh, exist over here uh, a strong feeling about position to Jews, but it can't be religious exactly because these people are converted. And so it has to be racial. And so we find in the 15th century the rise for the first time of, since the Greeks, let's say back in the Alexandria and Egypt, the rise for the first time of, of, of what you and I are familiar with in the 20th century, Hitler's racial, racially based anti-Semitism. Because okay? on what basis do you oppose the undue influence of the Jews in the government and the church? The undue powers of the Jews in, in uh, inclining the royal ear. They're not Jews. They're Jews, but they're not Jews. I mean, we're talking about people who are conversos. And naturally what happens in that kind of environment is the conversos hang together. You know, I'll help you if you help me. All these, think about this. These are all Catholics and they say, we've got to stick together against the Goyim. <laughs> <laughs> but it was true. And, and therefore, in other words, the terms of the contest, so to speak, were racial, weren't they? I mean, they were not religious. Right. I'm not referring to Jews who secretly practice Judaism, and, uh, uh, not at all. But nevertheless, you're a Jew. You see, uh, you can change the name from Moses, but they can't change the noses, as they always say. The, 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 the fact is, the, the fact is, well, you had it. And by the way, you're laughing. Poems like that start popping up right and left in Spain, in Castile, and Aragon, from Goyim, all through the 15th century, and it's perfectly understandable why. At the same time, this Jew, or converso, may be good in business and rise to position that one, and then if they have a lot of money, they'll marry with an uh, impecunious, an impoverished, uh, but very uh, high-class aristocratic family. It happens all the time. Right? So in other words, next thing you know, all these blue bloods are partly Jewish, and that just exacerbates the kinds of feelings that go on over here. So if anyone thought that as a result, 1391, the situation in Spain would sort of be ameliorated or 
they would end the Jewish question or things like that. It obviously reappeared in unexpected fashion. And uh, it really got violent. I just came in from out of town, so I didn't have time to bring all the material here, but I can assure you that if you really study the 15th century in gruesome detail, like that fat book from P Professor Netanyahu called The Origins of the Inquisition, some of you have seen it with the red cover, which is uh, 15,000 pages or something, and uh, he, that's exactly what he explores. You'll find it in Seville and in Saragossa and places like this, uh, civil wars break out within the cities themselves between two factions, the Jews and the Goyim, as they would call it, right? The Jews and the Jews, uh, the, 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 the new Christians and the old Christians, as they would put it. I mean, uh, uh, battles in the street, and it sort of boggles the mind. And uh, where do the regular Jews, the unconverted ones, they lay low, get out of the way, you know what I mean? The, 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 you, you, nothing, you can't win in any kind of situation over there. And so the 15th century was a nutty time to live in Spain, even though the violence of the 1391 to 1418 or so period was behind them. So the situation did not get better, it got more complicated. Right? And this situation goes all through the 15th century. That's unintended consequence number one. Here's the second one. And this really uh, bothered, freaked out the Catholics, and for perfectly understandable reasons. Um, atheism. You know, if you come from a family where one set of relatives tells you the Jewish religion is a bunch of baloney, and the other set of relatives tells you the Catholic religion is a bunch of baloney, uh, it's not too, you know, hard to understand that you might come to the conclusion both is true. And therefore, all religion is a bunch of baloney. And if you're really interested in rising in power, uh, you will uh, become uh, a principled opportunist, as they say over there, right? As the Israeli one said, I'm a man of principle, my first principle is expediency. You know, this, this becomes the, this becomes the, 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 the uh, mindset of Jews who want to rise and, uh, you know, sure they'll go to church and all that, but, but you know, they'll wink. And uh, when the preachers give all these speeches about hell and heaven and things like this, you know, to, to have to suppress a laugh or something like that. Or to maybe joke about it at home. And the maid will hear and tell others. And uh, this uh, horrifies the church. Because uh, atheism to them is actually worse than Judaism. S similar to a Jew would think this way also. The Rambam writes that way. And uh, that was not what they planned. In other words, the Jews are cheating. They're cheating on the contract. You're supposed to have converted. Or your parents or grandparents are. And now you're supposed to be one of us. You're supposed to be Catholics. And, uh, and this is uh, not supposed to happen, that you're supposed to become uh, skeptics, as they put it, cynics, and, uh, and disbelievers, and uh, people who uh, either openly or uh, secretly uh, make fun of the Catholic Church as well as religion in general. Now, of course, they never said to themselves, well, maybe we ran it down their throat. They put a gun there, everybody said in 1391, <laughs> and this is what you expect for trying to uh, tell somebody you better believe in this religion or else. You know how it goes. Nobody ever thinks like that. I'm perfect. You're the one that has the tsars. You're, the, the fault lies within you. But that is how people believe. And I can tell you that there was grounds for this because all during the 15th century, there are many traces within the Spanish culture of um, skepticism and cynicism in the religious area from conversos, children conversos, and grandchildren conversos. And the reason is easy to understand. Uh, this really was an unintended consequence. And, uh, you know, they didn't know what to do about it. Uh, for, for decades, they couldn't understand uh, the regular Spanish old Christians didn't do this. Uh, Spain is a country in which the Catholic religion was uh, rock solid because of these centuries, among other reasons, because of these centuries of battles against the Moors. And uh, now comes this whole new group. And, uh, you know, a convert should actually be more zealous than a born Christian, typically, uh, but how were they converted? You see? And uh, this as I say, got out of hand. I might add that uh, this phenomenon will re reappear in a funny, different way in the Jewish community uh, after 1492 among the Moranos. When uh, many Jews, um, after 1492 and after the expulsion, for the next three centuries, from pretty much from 1492 to 1792, basically, um, there were uh, uh, Jews, n new Christians, uh, what you and I would call converses, Moranos, obviously it's their children, their grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren, who for one reason or another uh, will want to run away from uh, Spain or Portugal and go to other parts of the world, particularly in Northern Europe, let's say Amsterdam, London, places like that, and come out of the closet and be Jewish. Well, uh, all the time that they were back in Spain, 
their parents, somehow or other, or their bubbies, I'm serious about this, somehow or other had to surreptitiously give them the uh, brainwashing that everything that they're doing and everybody around them doing is idolatry. And, 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 and communicate that in such a way that you won't tell when others and get us all in trouble. Um, but, but from their uh, teachers in school and their classmates, they hear that uh, Judaism is. And so uh, when they come to Amsterdam or Venice or London or places like that and they run away and they come out of the closet, if the Judaism they encounter is uh, not to their liking, and uh, when is Judaism ever to anybody's liking? Right? Uh, when, 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 when they, I mean, I wish every Jewish community was all perfect. Right? But, but it isn't. So uh, when they do this, they, they say a plague on both your houses, and that's how you get Spinoza. In, in the 1600, early 1600s in, in Amsterdam. You know, he's, he's the children of conversos who fled from Portugal to uh, Amsterdam. Um, there wasn't a uh, Sephardic infrastructure of chinuch and what they call in Israel klita to successfully uh, bring him into Judaism, answer all the questions and uh, socially integrate him. And the result was... Uh, he indeed became uh, h highly skeptical of all religion, and he dumped mainly on Judaism. So this phenomenon uh, begins already in, after 1391, but continues pretty much down till, till the time of the French Revolution, which is quite a statement I'm making, 600 years. But it's due to the fact that we're not dealing with typical cases of conversion, which is supposed to be gradual and, uh, and heartfelt, whatever you're converting to, but rather they're uh, violent and uh, abrupt and under enormous pressure and within a context of uh, dissension, disunion, hatred, and uh, don't expect much good to come out of that. So the 15th century produced all kinds of crazy things in Spain. Okay. Meanwhile, the Jewish community, the Jewish Jews, uh, still remained all over that map. Here in the, you know, where I'm pointing, you know, some communities have been wiped out like in Barcelona and other places. Others hadn't. And uh, from time to time, as I say, there, exceptionally, there were uh, outbreaks against specific Jewish communities here and there in the 14th. But overall, they weren't. And as I indicated at the end of uh, last lecture, the Jews, in the wake of destruction, uh, by the time 1420 or so came around, immediately began to pick up the pieces. They really took the attitude that people my age and older well, remember, right after the Second World War, which they said, we've got to set up Tarmus Sarah, we've got to re rebuild, uh, we can't uh, worry about what happened in the past, uh, that's counterproductive, and let's get on right, try to rebuild Yiddishkeit, which culminated, as I told you, in the great famous meeting of the Jewish representatives in 1432, uh, led by Don Abraham ben Venisti, who was the treasurer, the almost Sarif, of the King of Castile, you know, rich and powerful Jew, because he was able to deliver the bucks for the King of Castile, and they uh, got together and really made a, a full court press to rebuild Yiddishkeit by putting, as I told you last time, all their money in Chinuch. And so they did. And so it's really funny. We find an intellectual revival, I repeat, an intellectual and therefore a kind of spiritual revival among the shattered and battered Jewish communities in Spain at the same time that the cousins and the uncles and their children uh, are undergoing the unexpected vagaries of the Murano existence process. And I'm not even called Murano, it's the Converso process. You see? And now, think on the following uh, scene, for example, in 1430, 1440, 1460, uh, there's a chasana. I'm serious about this. There's a chasana uh, from this branch of the, uh, oh, what's a Sephardi name? Castro, of the Castro family. And uh, they, they, they stay in touch with each other. And uh, it's a Jewish branch. And so they're having a chubah and uh, they're going to have a wedding. And I might tell you, and you know, uh, Jewish weddings have always been notorious for being considered too extravagant, too wild, too party-like, and all the rest of it. People have been, the, the critics have been complaining about this forever. In other words, it's fun. So therefore, uh, so there, therefore, all the relatives are showing up. Okay, uh, this is not uncommon even in the American Jewish community today. What I'm talking about, but it has a particular twist to it in 1450. And so you have a strange situation where, you know, cousins meet each other, uncles, they, they share all the family stuff and all the rest of it, and everybody knows the white elf on the table, which is, you know, these guys are Jewish and the other cousins are, are Catholics. 
Uh, there could be a third, fourth, fifth cousins by now, several generations in there, but they stay together. Well, don't forget, uh, some of them still live on Pinckney and Taney and other streets within the Jewish community. They never left. There wasn't any kind of move on the part of the Catholic authorities after the forced conversion of them way back when to de you know, pick them up and physically transform, uh, transport them to an all-Catholic area. Uh, that happened a little bit by once in a while, like in Barcelona, getting rid of the Jewish community, but generally speaking, it didn't happen. And so the result is, uh, you get together, and you still have shaykhs one with the other, and, uh, you know, they're going to have the chuppah, and they're going to have the shavah brachas, and they're going to have the dancing, and the Jewish songs, and uh, they're joining in. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if the kids are uh, asking questions, what's going on, I don't know, each, each family had to work it out for itself. Uh, but you understand that uh, this is as far removed from a typical Catholic uh, background, especially a Spanish Catholic background, as possible. You see? And uh, people might say, I guess, this is your third cousin, uh, Shlomo. He's now in the yeshiva of Rabbi Yitzhak Abu Ab. It's a, it's a bit, very big yeshiva in Valencia. And uh, he's getting his smicha next year and all the rest of it. And, uh, you know, what are you learning here? Day? And, you know, it's, it's a funny kind of situation. And once again, it was unexpected, not at all what the Catholic Church had in mind when they uh, produced this huge mass uh, of, of, of conversions. So what I'm trying to bring out in, uh, in different ways is that uh, the fact that everybody was still together in Spain, sometimes living side by side, at other times getting together for holidays and things of this nature, uh, led to a situation which, from a strictly Catholic point of view, was very dangerous and certainly unheard of. And it's not America where it's very pluralistic and you can't criticize anything and everything goes and different relatives, you know, you do your thing, I do my. This is the 15th century in Spain. There's no such thing as you do your thing, I do my thing. You see? Um, and particularly, by the way, if one of the cousins might be by now a stark Catholic and he may go tell the priest, it's scandalous. You know, I was at this wedding where I heard about the wedding and people were singing Jewish songs and, uh, you know, uh, who knows what they're doing over there singing. And, um, uh, and I want you to know, my, my third cousin is deleting the, the, the charge. You know, and, the, and the priest complains to the archbishop and all the rest of it. So these kinds of reports are constantly flowing in from time to time to the higher-ups in uh, the church hierarchy and even in the government. Now, fortunately, during the uh, first period of the 15th century, 1420s, uh, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s even, um, they're fighting each other, they're having civil wars all the time. This king of Castile versus that one, this queen of Aragon versus that one. Aragon is now, we're now in the Renaissance period when the kings of Aragon have conquered this and they're fighting over here who should control Italy. This begins a series of wars in which the Spanish try to conquer and succeed in conquering Italy or huge chunks of it um, down to uh, Napoleon's time. Uh, you know, Spain had an empire, and the empire, a European empire, for those who don't know it, and uh, the European empire of Spain commences in the 1400s. So uh, this was good for the Jews. You know, they, 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 they had their minds on uh, all kinds of distractions, you might say, and uh, the bottom line is they need money, and, uh, you know, that's where the Jews come in. However, in the second half of the 1400s, the time you get to the 1470s or so, um, the... There's a, all kind of civil wars going on continually, but uh, she marries him. You understand? Isabella, who was uh, not supposed to be the queen, the king died and left different, different sons and daughters, and she's actually supposed to get killed. And what she ends up doing is uh, getting, uh, she had some Jewish guys that helped her, Jewish advisors that helped her. But at the end of the story, she marries the, the prince of, of Aragon, and now you have a situation where the two are going to be united by marriage. Okay, the, the Queen of Castile and the King of Aragon. You can already see this has the makings of the formation of a united kingdom, which is, of course, what it's going to end up doing. Now, it wasn't exactly a united kingdom. He was the king of his chalik, and she was the queen of her chalik, and, you know, she didn't allow, each one kept their own uh, rishus, as it were. It was just an interesting marriage. That's when they were very, very young, okay? Uh, Ferdinand and Isabella. Uh, I didn't say they were uh, models or anything, but uh, yeah, but but they were, but 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 they but they uh, were both very astute, and they're both highly intelligent. This is all bad, but they're highly intelligent. In fact, he he was one of the 
the smartest, I want to say something quite impressive now. He's one of the smartest kings in history, unfortunately. One of the most unscrupulous, sneaky, sneaky and clever and able uh, kings in history. He is the model of Machiavelli, who was a contemporary of his. When Machiavelli writes to Prince, at this time, in the late 1400s, he says, you want to know how to run a kingdom? Check out Ferdinand, how craftily he lays his uh, artifices and designs, uh, how uh, sneaky he is, how able he is in the intelligent use of the lie. That's what Machiavelli writes, right? You know, he is the guy, the man who's going to do it. And he was very successful in accomplishing his ends. Okay? So uh, she was no dummy either, but she couldn't keep up with him. The point is that as they unite, so the two of them together are able to suppress the rebellious nobles. They're able to establish each one in their own area a very strong centralized monarchy by the standards of the 15th century. And um, once they get their act together, they turn to all kinds of problems in their joint realms. One is the money problem, how to put the uh, budget from the red into the black, the kind of thing that we're fighting, struggling with in the United States of America today. Uh, they also try to regulate the power of the towns versus the power of the nobles, things like that. Uh, one of the items on the agenda, the conversos. It's not the only item, but it's one of the items on the agenda. And uh, it really offends them in many ways, on many levels, that you have this messy situation. It's not supposed to be messy. It's supposed to be the Jews and the Goyim. That's how they see it. The Jews and the Catholics. Uh, the Catholic the master race, because of their country. The Jews are the subject race, because they're just here on sufferance. That's the way it's supposed to be. And it's not like that. Maybe a hundred years before it was. It's not like that. There's the Catholics and Jews, and then there's inchoate large mass of people who are nishtahin and nishtaher, and uh, who, who, who uh, very unscrupulously are able to have a foot in both camps and uh, maneuver in the middle. And although we today might find it fascinating to, uh, to study, I might tell you, by the way, the university world, they love this uh, period because they're gender benders. You know, in other words, they're, 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 they're cases of gray areas and identity. And that's very in in the modern world of a gay politics, seriously. And uh, things like that. Uh, you, uh, I, I kid you not. But uh, for 15th century Catholic, uh, it's horrifying. And different. they say, we're going to fi fix this up. And so uh, Ferdinand and Isabella, especially Ferdinand, uh, they say like this, the church earlier in its history, when it fought certain heresies, having nothing to do with the Jews. Heresies are defined as anybody that tried to compete with the official policy of the Catholic Church, of which you had a bunch on the courts of the Middle Ages. They were always successfully suppressed. And one of the ways to suppress them was through wars like the Albigensian Wars back in the, what, the 1200s, something like a million people were killed because of uh, machlokas in Christianity over whether the, you know, uh, the bread, the wafer and the wine really becomes a body or a blood or things of this nature. But whatever the case is, they, 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 they had um, mechanisms and structures created earlier in the history of the Catholic Church to deal with heresies. Um, let's introduce it into Castile and Aragon, and of course I'm talking about the Inquisition. Okay. You don't have to have a war against the conversos. They don't have an ar army and a power like that, but they're all over the place, and the way to deal and combat with that would be for an efficient uh, police uh, state apparatus to, to deal with it, and that's what they introduced in 1480. Okay. So uh, contrary to popular belief, uh, the, the, the Inquisition didn't exist until shortly before 1492. And uh, they're empowered to, they're gr granted wide powers by the state. It's a church arm, belongs to the Catholic Church, uh, but they're granted the widest powers by the state to do inquisitions, inquiries, to inquire, okay. to uh, check up on people. And of course, specifically talking about the, the crime of Judaism, which is a, a Judaism doesn't mean Jewish religion. Judaism would be a cat in the Catholic Church, a crime of a Catholic um, becoming Jewish or adopting Jewish practices. So if somebody gets convicted and burned, the crime of Judaism means that they're not Jewish, at least as the church defines it, and they're acting Jewish. And that's a, a, a severe crime, always has been in the history of the Catholic Church. Um, and now, from time to time, in the history of the church, you've had different groups, believe it or not, in different places, uh, and this is even in Russia, uh, people who are Christians, who all of a sudden decided, uh, let's keep Shabbos on Saturday, or let's keep kosher, um, but they were suppressed. And these would simply be, uh, they're non-Jewish, 
uh, Krishnas who read the Old Testament, and it said, uh, And they said, well, gee, you know, what about that? And, uh, you know, and, and they're accused by the church of being literalists and misunderstanding the, 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 uh, how the Old Testament has been superseded by the New, and uh, they were punished. Now you have a very specific twist, of course, in Spain, and has to do with the Jewish Jews, or the new Jews, or the children or grandchildren by now. 1480, anybody who was alive in 1391 is dead. The, it's their children, that, actually it's their grandchildren or great-grandchildren already. So think about this. You have people, I mean, talk to me about identity crises of extraordinary proportions. You know, kids grow up and, what are you, who are you? Um, Catholic, sort of, Jewish, sort of, you know, I got cousins, to, you know. You know what I'm saying? It, it, it creates a, a sort of unprecedented dynamic. And Ferdinand Isabella said, we're going to stop this. And uh, the idea with the Inquisition is we're going to give everybody one year to confess and stop. We have a year of grace. We're giving fair warning, and it's fair warning. Afterwards, we're going after you. Now, what's really fascinating is that in uh, Castile, let's go back to the map, in this area, this was extremely uh, popular. And uh, although some people had uh, some doubts about it, uh, but it got through fairly easily. Here it was strongly resisted, but Ferdinand, the sneaky guy that he was, shoved it down their throats anyway. What, meaning many uh, old Christians uh, didn't want to introduce this into Spain. And the reason for that, of course, would be not because they like Jews, but the reason for that is obvious. Uh, what would the reason be? Money. Well, how would it be money? What's that? That's right. In other words, you're creating a monster. And who knows where it's going to lead? You're endowing an organization with the craziest powers. Uh, they can arrest you and uh, torture you, get a confession, and uh, you know, there's no rid of habeas corpus, and uh, they get the money, which really makes it scary, because then there's always an incentive to lie about you. And where does it stop? No, this is Thomas Jefferson type arguments. It's not that they were Thomas Jefferson's, but within their own specific context, you don't want to create a, a, a uh, what do they call it in Russia, a KGB or something like that, a Gestapo, which, which is just a, a separate organization, not under anybody's real control, which can, uh, you know, starts here, but who knows where it ends. And many nobles, uh, leaders of cities and things like that were in Spain were against it because they were scared it would come to bite them. Little by little it was suppressed. All opposition to it was suppressed. And the Inquisition was... Uh, put into place. Uh, the Pope in Rome, who was Spanish at that time, right, this guy, uh, here's another model, he said, the, 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 the Pope in Rome, uh, Alexander, uh, he wasn't so happy about it. Uh, he said, you know, uh, who's going to control this? If it's a church in institution, it should be under the papal control. I, I should run it. But the king and queen of uh, Ferdinand Isabel said, no, we'll run it. We'll appoint everybody. And uh, it'll be run by priests, but we get to a point who the priests are. And, uh, you know, he didn't approve it because he said, how, how, how do you know it's not going to get out of control? Imagine this. The Pope in Rome said, this may become too from. You know, it can run amok. Uh, but if you know anything at all about Pope Alexander VI, he's more or less the most corrupt Pope in the history of Catholic Church. Uh, you know, what do you have, 60 or 70 mistresses? Of this is the ones with the Borgias and all that, where they're all poisoning each other. And so he was bought off. That's the bottom line. And uh, so it happened. Once the Inquisition was set up, there's a new ball game, because that means it took a little while, but not too long, till they set up a an organization of frighteningly uh, marvelous simplicity. In every town, in every location, there's a uh, chapter of the uh, Holy Office, as they call it, the, the Inquisition, when they and they all report to central offices, and uh, they set up a big uh, system of investigations, and they have their own, and uh, it's a snitch system, obviously. And whoever tells on somebody, the, there's a, a tribunal, three priests or something like that, where they, they uh, see if the person who's doing the snitching is nuts or not. Because, you know, you can always have somebody walk off off the street, raving lunatic, and say, I saw somebody jump off the moon, and, you know, and he's Jewish, so not going to pay attention to him. But anybody else, they will pay attention to. And all they need is that there should be what we call in Hebrew a glimla dover, you know, and, and any evidence circumstantial whatsoever, and uh, they'll arrest you. And once you arrest you, you're in big trouble because um, they perfected over a generation, not in the very beginning, but within a short time, they perfected a system of scaring anybody into totally confessing. Right? Uh, first of all, 99% of the time, they didn't have to 
because they would take you into a room and then walk you through a really low tunnel with water up to here and the torch on both sides already looks like you're in Gehenna. And then they walk you into even a smaller room and in there are all kind of torture instruments. And this is what we're going to do to your eyes. And this is what we're going to do to your ears. This is what we're going to do, you know. All, and uh, they, they usually didn't even have to use it. When you see that, you say like this, I'll say whatever you want, just get me out of here. And uh, of course, what they would then say is like, we know about you, but we want you to give the name of everybody else involved. You see? And if the person says, I don't know anybody else involved, they say, well, how, let, let, let's give you some suggestions. <laughs> right? You know, don't you think this guy is also doing it? Yes, whatever you tell me. You see? Of course, there are cases where people didn't talk and uh, were tortured and things, but you know, it's very rare. It's very rare. Who, who, who can handle this? And uh, they, they, they had created a monster. And what made it even more monstrous was the fact that uh, if someone's convicted, then the Inquisition gets the money, which they divided with the king in some proportion. I don't remember the exact amount. But uh, once you make a financial incentive, then uh, you really opened the doors. Because uh, anybody, let's put it this way, in a town who's wealthy or gets somebody else ticked off at them or uh, has any kind of Jewish blood in them whatsoever, or a dozen, but people will say they do, uh, you have material here for a thousand novels, you know, like a Balzac thing or something, where this person, like that person, they weave a whole weave of intrigue in order to get them, all you have to do is just get, get them uh, suspicious. The Inquisition, it arouses suspicions in the Inquisition, and uh, they'll get arrested, and they'll get uh, investigated, and who knows what. For this reason, there is a huge debate, again, among the historians, whether the Inquisition records are reliable or not. You understand? Uh, some historians make a very strong case that they're all tainted, and you can't believe anything they say in there. Others disagree. I myself happen to think that they're pretty accurate. That's my opinion. But you know, they're, 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 I'm just one person. You know, there are many strong, big scholars on both sides of the issue. If you believe what they say in the Inquisition, all through the 1480s and into 1492, uh, they're finding cases all over Spain of what I just described before. The Catholic cousins are going to the Hasana. Uh They're attending a bar mitzvah in, in, in Shomri. They're, uh, how is it, you know, they're, they're, they're going to a bris. Uh, they're getting to, they're getting to get our tish above, believe it or not. You understand? Uh, tell me what it means to be a Kirov activist in 1480 in Spain. If you don't think that there were people like that who said, these people are all Jewish, you know, we've got to bring them back to the, to, to, to the faith. How are you going to do what we'll do it surreptitiously or some other way? Uh, yeah, we're, this is what's happening. And so uh, if you believe that, then you're going to believe that there was an enormous amount of Judaizing going on among the great-grandchildren, basically, of the original conversos, and they were doing everything I just described. On the other hand, if you follow the other historians, it's all tainted, then you're going to say, none of that's happening, it's all baloney. These were big, huge lies concocted by Ferdinand, who was not exactly strange to lies, Ferdinand and Isabella, and the Inquisition. All the Jews, the great-grandchildren now were totally not Jewish. They were completely immersed in Catholic religion and Catholic culture, and the whole thing was one big bilble in order just to rip them off. Those are the two sides of the debate. You can choose whatever you wish. Uh, my, my personal feeling from Kishkas is I think there's, there is truth to it. But this will become the, the reason for the expulsion of 1492. Let me, therefore, uh, bring out one very important point. Uh, a very common misconception is the Inquisition went after Jews. That's not true. The Inquisition had no power to touch Jewish Jews. They were empowered to touch Christian Jews were Jewish Christians, more, more exactly, the, the, the descendants of the new Christians. You understand? If you were lucky enough to have been, as I said before, on Greenspring Avenue when the riots hit, or uh, for one reason or another, had never converted, uh, you could practice Judaism openly, and they did. And uh, the Catholic Church had, was not granted by the king or the queen any power to touch them. After all, it was not a crime, and never had been, to be a Jew. No. Remember, the great wave of conversions in the 1390s and afterwards happened spontaneously. There was no king or queen of Castile or Aragon or anywhere else who said, now I'm, now I'm forcing all the Jews to convert. Never happened. They took the attitude, 
all these people just converted. I know it was a, you know, violence alone got out of hand, but uh, it was a spontaneous uh, uprising on the part of the Spanish people. Uh, you know, they're tired of the Jewish heretics among us. Uh, it just happened. Uh, the original laws were still in the books and were observed. The laws that said Jews can be Jews. Consequently, if somebody, as they say before, was Jewish, like the environment or somebody like that, you could wear a yarmulke, you could wear payas, you could do whatever you wanted to do, and the Inquisition had no power over you. But if you were the unlucky cousins, uh, then you were in big trouble. If, no matter how Jewish you may have felt, and I'm sure this happened, I mean, you know, and I know, this, this had to happen. Just when, when the relatives main con maintain contact with each other, some will be indifferent to Judaism, some will be turned off to Judaism, some won't. So, some relative will be, just be interested in the Jewish side of their family and the Jewish practices to one degree or another. Even there doesn't mean someone's going to become Jewish, but they'll be guilty of what the Catholic Church regards as Judaizing. Somebody might say like this, I'm a uh, uh, you know, Disraeli converted, was converted by his father in England in the 1800s when he was 13 years old. Uh, even, even after he became a Christian in Victorian England, uh, once in a while he went to Jewish weddings or uh, even a synagogue once, he saw like the old tunes. Well, in England, in the Victorian time, there was a little inquisition, so people said, that's just cute. In Spain, if somebody does, I like the old tunes. You know, uh, Jewish music interests me. There are people who are not Jewish today in the United States of America who are interested in Jewish tunes. I mean, I'll just give you one word to give the klezmer, you know. There are people like that. In Spain, the 1500s, who were interested in things like they're guilty of the crime of Judaizing. And you can get burnt. And they were. Okay? And so, right away, this reign of terror descends upon the half of the Jewish population, if I can use that term, who are the descendants of the conversos. And, uh, and they're really exposed to the full fury. Okay? They're exposed to the real McCoy. Uh, it, that's Torquemada's head inquisition. Let's go past that for a minute. Uh, yeah, here, Jake has organized. I was out of town, so he pulled down from the internet a whole, a whole horror series. I don't know if you can see them or not. Of uh, That one's pretty tame where they're assigning people, yeah, he's being burned at the stake. These are eyewitness uh, accounts, you understand? Keep going. And this guy's being uh, stoked over here with, with, uh, with a pitchfork, you know, to make sure that he's roasting properly. I kid you not. I mean, that's what's happening. Go on. Here's another guy being, uh, you know, hanged and burned slowly. He's being uh, roasted and toasted over the fires. So he shouldn't die too fast. Go on. <laughs> Here's a bunch of guys being burned at the same time. These are pictures that People are making for the newspapers, the chapbooks of that period, not as a horror story. Uh, the, these uh, things are, uh, they sell, uh, they sell like a uh, 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 nickel comics, things like that. Th these things are sold in the 15th and 16th century uh, and popularly. Do you have any more? Okay, well, you get the idea, right? And uh, that's what happens if you are this cousin. It won't happen to you if you're that cousin. If you're Jewish, Jewish, you don't have to worry about that from 1480 to 1492 or afterwards. Uh, but if you're the wrong cousin and you're descended, it's not even your fault, it's descended from someone who converted, uh, then you will literally uh, you know, become toast. And the result is that um, a reign of terror descends upon the Ranos, their descendants, and it doesn't go away. And you know, you can understand that the Jews, the converts and the others, they figure this is a the last one lasted a couple years, and then it went away. Uh, this one also will. Let's hold out till the storm blows over. Ferdinand will do anything for money, which typically was true. You know, uh, let's get to him. Uh, you know, get to his counselor, get to his advisors. And there are all kinds of movements in the 1480s uh, to, to uh, somehow or other revoke and undo the Inquisition. They didn't know what you and I know, which was that the Inquisition would become in Spain something uh, unique and extremely popular as well as an extremely feared institution. The most popular and the most feared institution in Spanish life for the next 400 years, 350 years. That, that's a long time. Ad que Descartes, when Napoleon in 1808 invades Spain, leading the French armies there, and he's a representative of the French Revolution, he puts his brother on the throne and he abolishes the Inquisition. Okay? In fact, the French army comes there in 1808 and they invade Inquisition headquarters and they find the dead bodies, uh, you know, underneath the ground and the skulls and who knows, all kind of horror stories over there. 
and he shows the Spanish people, look what's going on over here. And uh, they get so angry that they have a huge uprising against Napoleon, and in an extremely bloody war, uh, they kick him out. It took f four years or five years, and the Duke of Wellington becomes famous for being the English general who helps the Spaniards kick the French out. And they have all these novels and movies and things like this about the heroic Spaniards kicking out the French. Well, not from the Jewish point of view. Huh? I mean, they're, they're, they're restoring the beloved Inquisition. So it's really weird how this gained a hold on the Spanish cultural mindset, but it did. Okay, so this is the way things are going on in the 1480s. Uh, ironically, as I told you before, the yeshivas are flourishing as never before. <laughs> uh, really. really. Uh, the, the, after 1432, there is a, uh, a real um, result of pouring the money into Chinuch, uh, a galaxy of Sephardic uh, scholars, Torah scholars, Talmudic giants, appears uh, in the 1400s. Today they're not so well known. In their day they were very famous. The most famous person of all this, I can't go into a great deal about this, is Rabbi Yitzhak Kampanton, who is known as the Gaon of, of Castile, who writes a, uh, this is going to be funny, a, a methodological book on how to do pilpul. A sign, I'm serious, a scientific methodology on how to study the Talmud with pilpul. You understand? It's called Darke uh, Gamor. And uh, this is uh, you know, very, very uh, uh, typical of this period in which they take, so to speak, the, the, the best of current Renaissance uh, scientific approach, because the scientific method is being formed, as we all know, during the 15th century in Renaissance Italy, and you're applying it to the study of the Talmud. Okay? But at the same time, uh, the situation is getting worse and worse. In the 1480s, they're going after the new Christians. They're not going after the Jews. Uh, Ferdinand and Isabella are still dealing with all kinds of political problems, and they, so to speak, perceive the need for the Jews. Let's go back to the map. There you go. In, around 1489, 1490, uh, this, which is still a Muslim kingdom, that had still been left over from the wars of the 1200s, when the Christians had conquered everything but that. But then, if you remember, the Christians stopped fighting the Muslims and the rest of the time fought each other. Uh, now, there was a series of border incidents. It's too tedious to go into. And suffice it to say that war breaks out between this and that. That was kind of stupid of Granada to do that, but that's what happened. Okay? It so happens at that time, this Muslim kingdom of Granada, which had Jews in it, by the way, at that time, uh, was engaged in one of these very bitter internecine Arab wars, one group against the other. I told you, the history, even the Caliphate of Cordoba, was one in which there was a uh, sort of cycle in which at certain times they display great military prowess and energy against the non-Muslims, and then they fight each other. And at this particular point, they were fighting each other very bitterly, and uh, therefore it was the wrong time to pick a war with those big giants out there, especially when it's run by two sneaky people like Ferdinand and Isabella, and the result is the Great War of 1490-1492, right? Really takes place in 1491, in which, uh, after great preparations and raising a lot of money, the money is raised from primarily Jewish borrower lenders to the government. The uh, loans are are organized and uh, directed by a Barbanel. Uh, you know that's that's who uh, who we call the Barbanel, Rabbi Yitzhak Barbanel, the great Bible commentator, was. Um, a Portuguese Jew who had to run away from Portugal at a certain point and ended up in Castile, working for Queen Isabella, and uh, he was one of those Alma Sarifs. He was one of those Jewish money guys. That is to say, he farmed the taxes, he organized the IRS, he um, oversaw the collection of revenues, the kind of thing that Jews in high positions have been doing in Spain forever. And uh, now that Ferdinand Isabella having a war against the Granada, uh, they say to him, he said, well, you know, we need the money. And he figures, uh, if you do favors for the king, then you, that's how you get their favor. Isn't that right? If you raise the money for them, that ought to demonstrate Jewish loyalty, a Jewish utility. Um, if only they had known that they were about to uh, discover America, I uh, think what would, in 1492, just imagine if they hadn't kicked the Jews out of 1492 and you needed businessmen and capitalist enterprise to uh, organize the economic side of that, and uh, you know, people like the Barbanella would have really uh, preceded the English and the Dutch in, in building up the economy of the New World, but that's a what if. The bottom line is, 
that uh, in, in early in 1492, they, the combined armies of Castile and Aragon finish off this. They take over Granada. Uh, that means that Spain now has a different map. It's all Christian for the first time since 712. In 712, with the first Arabs landed in Spain. Uh, ever since then, as you've seen here, uh, the Arabs controlled 99% of it, or 9% of it, or some, but they always controlled a part of Spain. It was never an all Christian country. It had been prior to 712, and now it is again. This engendered, for perfectly understandable reasons, a feeling of extraordinary triumphalism. Uh, think about that. Our fathers, our grandfathers, and all this have fought for this day, and we did it. You see, we did it. This engenerated uh, obvious feelings of enthusiasm, and uh, how will that enthusiasm be expressed? Okay. Uh, they're not going to create a country called Spain. He still wants to be the king of Castile, uh, queen of, she wants to be queen of Castile, and he still wants to be king of Aragon. Uh, but you can see that they're gelling together, and they're creating a great and powerful state. One thing they want to do is make sure the Muslims never come back. Uh, one thing they want to make sure is they get national security and that all the harsh tales that they heard from their childhood about the battles of the, you know, against the Muslims and all that uh, are, are in the distant past. Uh, one way, in fact the only way, of ensuring that is to get rid of all uh, non-Christians. And uh, when you combine that with the fact that the Inquisition claimed at least and I think it's true, to be discovering all the time, case after case, of cousins going to Hasanas, then it all comes together in the final conclusion that once they win the war and they don't need the Jews anymore, on the day that uh, Ferdinand and Isabella make their triumphal entry into the formerly Muslim city of Granada, and they take possession of that famous palace, the Alhambra Palace, which is built in the time of Shmuel and Nugget, uh, the splendid uh, palace, in the Alhambra they issue their famous declaration of expulsion. And, and what is the reason that they're expelled? Well, here's the, here's the Nusuch. Right? Listen, li listen to what they say. It's online. And it starts, you know, King Isabella, by Ferdinand, by the grace of our King, Queen Castile, Leon, etc., 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 to all of our bishops, machers, etc., 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 uh, all the Jews and all the individual Jews, the places, barons, women, whatever age, da 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 da. Shalom. Salutations and grace. You know, this is what the king and queen write. This is their, their, their proclamation. You know well, or you ought to know, that whereas we have been informed that in these, our kingdoms, there were some wicked Christians who Judaized and apostatized from our holy Catholic faith. The great cause of this was the interaction between the Jews and these Christians. In the Cortes or parliaments which we held in the city of Toledo this past year, uh, in the past year of 1480, we ordered the separation of those Jews in all the cities, towns, and villages of our kingdoms and lordships and commanded they be given Jewish quarters in separate places where they should live, meaning we tried to set up a ghetto system so that the cousins wouldn't meet. All the Jews who live in the Jewish neighborhood and all the new Christians, all the descendants of the conversos, will live in the Christian neighborhood. They tried to make all the Jews live in Park Heights. And all the others moved to, I don't know, Glen Burnie or something. Uh, that's exactly what they tried to do. Hoping, we hoped that by their separation, the situation would remedy, remedy itself. Furthermore, we procured and gave orders that an inquisition should be made in our kingdoms and lordships, which, as you know, has now for 12 years been made and is being made. And by many guilty persons have been discovered, as is very well known, and accordingly we are informed by the inquisition and other devout people that great injury has resulted and still results since the Christians have engaged in and continue to engage in social interaction and communication. They have the means and ways they can to subvert and steal faithful Christians from our holy Catholic faith and separate them from it. So the Jewish Jews are acting as a bad hashpa, like a magnet, on the conversos. It's just a problem. We, we try to deal with it peacefully by separate, and nothing is working. It's still happening right now. This Kirov is taking place. And uh, these Jewish Jews draw them to themselves, meaning draw the converses themselves, and subvert them to their own wicked belief and conviction. Listen to this. The Jewish Jews 
are instructing them in the ceremonies and observances of their law. They're holding meetings at which they read and teach that which people must hold and believe according to their law. They have really care, you know, discovery seminars, you know, care sessions, <laughs> achieving that the Christians and their children, meaning the conversos, should now <laughs> be circumcised. And which people uh, are giving them books from which they may read their prayers. This is a uh, Chabad, you know. They're, what? they're giving they're giving him sedurim. You understand? This is what we, we've been told. And declaring to them the fast days they must keep, they give them Jewish calendars. And tell them it's coming up Tisha B'Av. And joining with them to read and teach them the history of their law. They don't care of classes. Indicating to them the festivals before they occur, advising them of what in them they are to hold and observe, carrying to them and giving them from their houses unleavened bread. Oh, that's terrible. They're bringing their cousin. There is a Kirov movement, which the Jews are, are stupid enough to think is surreptitious and not being noticed. Everything is being noticed. If anybody here ever was in the Soviet Union, no, everything's noticed. You, you, you can fool yourself thinking nobody's looking. They're looking. And they bring them meats, which are ritually slaughtered, instructing them about the things from which they must refrain, as much in eating as in other things, in order to observe their Jewish law, and persuading them as much as they can to hold and observe the law of Moses, convincing them that there's no other law or truth except that one. These are the crimes of the Jewish Jews. This is proved by many statements and confessions, both from these same Jews, and from those whom they have perverted and enticed by them, which have redounded to the great injury, detriment, and opprobrium of our holy Catholic faith. Notwithstanding that we were informed of the great part of this before now, and we knew that the true remedy for all these injuries and conveniences was to prohibit all interaction between the Jewish Jews and the Christians and banish them from all our kingdoms, we desired, now this is Ferdinand, you know, the liar, he said, you know, I could have done this a long time ago, but I'm not a <laughs> We desired to content ourselves by commanding the Jews to leave the cities, towns, and villages of Andalusia, where it appears they've done the greatest injury, believing that would be sufficient, so that those of other cities, towns, and villages, um, towns and villages of our kingdoms would cease to these aforesaid acts. So we thought, as I told you before, we could somehow stop it by, uh, you know, sending them all to, to Glen Burnie or something like that. Uh, and since we're informed that neither that step nor the passing of sentence of condemnation against the Christian Jews, who have been guilty of crimes against their Catholic faith, have been sufficient as a complete remedy to obviate and correct so great an appropriate defense to the faith. Since nothing has worked, the Kiruv continues. They're still sending them masses. They're still sending them sitters and all kinds of other crimes like that. Uh, because every day it is found and appears that the said Jews in increase and continue their evil and wicked purpose wherever they live and congregate. Those, these Jews are incorrigible. They just automatically shift into a Kiruv mode. So that there will not be any place where they will further offend their holy faith and corrupt those who God has wished to preserve, etc., etc. Um, the bottom line is so we're getting rid of them. Therefore, uh, you know, it goes on and listen, therefore we, the, with the counsel and advice of our prelates, the great noblemen, and all these others, have taken deliberation about this matter, and we, we resolve to order these Jews and Jewesses of our kingdoms to depart and never to return or come back to any of them. And concerning this, we command uh, this, our charter, to be given, by which we order all Jews, male and female, whatever age, whatever age they may be, who live and reside and exist in our kingdoms, as much as natives, uh, or those who are not, knows whether you're born here or not, and by whatever manner, whatever cause have come to live and reside in and Aragon, by the end of the month of July, next of this present year, they depart from all these, are said, realms and lordships, along with their sons and daughters, their servants and maidservants, meaning Jewish, of course, their Jewish familiars, meaning members of the family, those who are great, as well as those who are lesser, those rich or poor, uh, of whatever age they may be, and dare not to return to those places that reside in them or live in them, or any part of them, neither temporarily on the way, or somewhere else in any other manner, knows I want them ever to be in Spain again, Balyarol, Balyamase, under pain that if they do not perform and comply with this command, uh, they'll be incurred penalty of death and confiscation of their uh, possessions by our finance minister, incurring various penalties. And we command and forbid that any persons of the said kingdoms shall receive, protect, defend, or hold publicly or secretly any Jew or Jewess beyond the end of July, and then we'll punish them in this, that, and the other. The end of July was two days before Tisha B'Av. That's how it works out.
if you, if, if you look it up on the map. Okay. And so, I, 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 I do want to finish this because it's important. And so, the said Jews and Jewesses during the stated period of time until the end of the month of July may be better able to dispose of themselves and their possessions in the state. For the present, we take and receive them under our security, protection, royal safeguard. We don't want anybody to say, the next 90 days, uh, you know, you should, or, or, or three months or whatever it is, harm the Jews. This is, after all, a country of law and order. Right? We're doing a favor. Uh, and we secure to them and to their possession for the duration of that time until the said day of the last month. They may travel, be safe, enter, sell, trade, alienate all their movable or rootable possess uh, rooted possessions, dispose of them freely in their will, and that in the said time no one shall harm them or injure them, no harm shall be done against them or against justice, in their persons, their possessions, and the penalty which falls and occurred on anyone who violates the royal command. And we likewise give license and faculty to those Jews and Jewesses that they're able to export their goods and estates out of the kingdoms uh, by sea and land as long as they do not export silver or gold or coin money or other prohibited laws that court except merchandise and things are not prohibited. So they can take their stuff with them, but think... Wait a minute. Hold on for a second. Not gold and silver. We can take goods. Well, I, I want you to understand what they're saying over here. Uh, if, if you have money in the bank and you're from and you want to leave Spain, uh, you have to... Listen, that money's not going to be yours in 90 days. So spend the money now. Uh, buy goods and stuff. Tchotchkes. Ta take them with you. That's exports. Do you get it? And that way the king will say, I didn't take a penny from anybody. This sounds uh, civilized. And may I say, compared to Hitler, it sure is. No, 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 all kidding aside, remember, technically speaking, the kings in Spain and Queen of Spain simply were invoking their right that they never chose to invoke before. The Jews are not Spaniards. The Jews had no legal recourse and said, this is our country or something like that. Many thought they were. That was a fooling themselves for centuries, but they had none. The, 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 the rug could be pulled out from under them at any time, and was. You know what I'm they said, we're, we're, we're tired of having you. We're not killing anybody. you got 90 days. As they say, you can't take cash, but you can you know, take goods and go. Now, you know and I know, if somebody's got 90 days to, to liquidate, you know, uh, what are the Christian uh, businessmen going to do? I mean, are they going to give them a good deal or a bad deal? I mean, you, you understand. But nevertheless, this is the way uh, they framed it. And uh, for the next 30 days, uh, for the next three months, uh, you know, Jews went crazy, uh, trying to liquidate. Well, every family had to decide. This is no joke. Um, let's say, I'm making this up. Let's say, you have, <coughs> let's say you have $2 million in the bank. That's not so easy. You gotta be, you, know, you gotta be. Let's say you have uh, a lot of real estate or you have a big house or things. It's not, it just isn't that easy. You can't deny it. You see? Uh, let's say you have all kind of relatives and, and uh, you're rooted in the status quo. It's not that easy. And for that reason, a lot of Jews uh, said, um, I'm gonna convert. Uh, I didn't do it until now, uh, but now they really are playing hardball and it's just too hard. And remember, they didn't know what you and I know, which is hindsight, that this was never going to go away. And many people, you know how the age of hard work, many people say, uh, this is a Mishigas, but, uh, you know, uh, give it another two, three years, uh, things will die down. Like the famous joke that, the, you know, the dog will die, the king will die, you know, something, something will happen uh, along the way, and, uh, and, and, and sanity will reassert it. After all, in 1391, it took 25 years, but, it, but sanity reasserted itself in the end. So it may take another 25 years, but in the end, uh, Spain will come back to its senses. And at that time, Gitzchanesa will figure something out. Now, I repeat, blessed with the hindsight that you and I obviously have living later, we say this is a fool's paradise. Uh, if anything, the Inquisition was only get worse and worse. As I told you before, it was only get more and more popular, even as it became more and more feared in Spain and Portugal. Uh, but they didn't know that. Or, let's put it this way, they didn't want to know it. And so the result is, plenty. now we have a new set of cousins, don't we? In addition to the fact that you had two sets of cousins, those who were Jewish-Jewish and those who were new Christians, now you're going to have, from this group, break it in half. Half of the cousins who were Jewish are now going to become Christians. And so, of the original Jews of Spain in 1391, I'm sure less than a quarter remained Jewish-Jewish. Uh, less than a quarter said... We're going to bite the bullet and uh, liquidate whatever it is, and we're going to leave in order to keep Yiddishkeit. That's what it is. 
These are called Sephardim Tahorim, among themselves. These are the Sephardi Tahors that you see people sign their name Samach Tes, whether rightly or wrongly. What they mean are, we are Sephardim, but we were not metame ourselves for money. We never uh, practiced uh, Christianity. Uh, we're not Muranos. Now, by the way, there were heroic Muranos who later on escaped and all that kind of stuff. This, this is true, but that's not who we are. We, our families, were never among those who, when the big test came in 1492, uh, went for the money and the cars over the Yiddishkeit. We uh, suffered for our faith, and, and, and we survived, and we're proud of it. And, I mean, this, this is their uh, ethnic piety, and, and, and justly so. And the result was that uh, you have as many human situations as uh, you have human beings among the Jews of this time. The numbers are crazy. Some say a quarter of a million left, some say 100,000 left. So a huge number is uh, left, but even larger numbers stayed, or something like that. You know, don't ever expect to believe this set of figures, that set of figures. But we know we're talking with the lar- by far the largest Jewish population in the world. It's sort of like it would happen, not exactly, but it's sort of like what happened in the United States of America, God forbid. Right? Where the largest and most well-off Jewish community found itself faced with this kind of test. And uh, we can even imagine, uh, since it's Arab Tisha B'o, and such a thing would happen, which Jew would, 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 would give everything up and which Jews wouldn't? And, uh, and, and are we all so confident that, you know, you say, oh, yeah, I, I wouldn't do that. It's, it, you, they say, don't judge somebody until you're in, in their shoes. But it was a really tough situation. Now, there are stories, uh, some factual, some not so factual. It's hard to get the facts over there. The Abarbanel uh, sort of tells the fact that he went and he tried to buy off the king uh, and the queen. And, uh, you know, it was going to happen, but it didn't happen then. It wasn't going to happen. If you knew at all who Ferdinand of Aragon was, uh, and leaving even Isabella aside, and she was a Machshefa too, but if you know who Ferdinand of Aragon was, there was no way uh, he was not going to do this. Uh, he thought in long strategic terms, and he was in the pot process of creating Spain, and he did it. See? And he did it. Aside from the fact he got a ton of money out of it, but he, he had big uh, strategic goals. He wanted a country that was uh, 100% uniform, and he got it. And th- this is what he wanted, and you can't blame him. He wanted a Spain that was all Catholic. Uh, there were still some Muslims around because of the treaty with the King of Granada. They didn't mess with them yet. It took another 60, 70 years, and then they got rid of them. The same thing happened. Now, this is not part of our history, but as far as Islamic history, the Moriscos, as they call them, later on kicked up a King Philip II of Spain later in the 1500s. But the goal was to have a pure Spain. That's what, and, and they were doing whatever it takes to do it, and, and they, they did do it. There is a whole... Uh, literature of the sufferings and the travails of those who leave. First of all, some people got ripped off. That's an understatement. But beside that, uh, you know, crisis brings out uh, the best and the worst in people. And so some families tore each other to bits and, you know, this brother stayed and this brother didn't stay and he tried to take his land and, and you know, and, and people are leaving and uh, I have to move uh, to Turkey or Italy and I'll try to steal what I can to take with me on the boat. And other people respond to crisis by acting uh, with nobility. And people uh, helped each other out, uh, tried to uh, provide chizuk in various ways to fellow Jews who are going to leave. Um, there are stories on both sides of the ledger. There are, in addition, there's a very famous book that came out not long after this. Right uh, here, called The Shevet Yehuda which I've mentioned before. This is uh, the Tisha B'Av book, so to speak. It's a classic of Jewish historiography of the old school of the chronologies. The Shevi Yehuda, which now with Nakud is a very nice edition, uh, put out by the Ibn Verga family, father, son, grandson. Uh, some of it was written before 1492, some was written after 1492, and this is the book that our grand- grandparents and all that back in the old country, everybody used to read and know uh, as part of the Jewish library, as it were, in those days. And whenever you want to know something about Spain, you read the stories in the Shevet Yehuda, and uh, I'll tell you, uh, and I'll conclude, uh, two stories over here, that, uh, or two of many, uh, which, which bring out uh, the uh, depths and the grandeur in a startlingly uh, tragic fashion of the departure of the Jews uh, from Spain when so many were ripped off and they end up, uh, the, you know, the, the, the captains take their money and then dump them in an island and leave them to die or they throw them into Morocco somewhere and they starve to death or eat grass or, you know, all kind of terrible things happen to them because refugees are refugees. 
Refugees are refugees. You know, when the refugees came to this country, or after the First World War and after the Second World War, listen, I'm about to say, there was American Jewry. Well, people don't know. You know, you had a joint, you had a Valetzola, and you have things like that. That didn't exist. They really were exposed totally to what others wanted. They had no power. It's a dangerous state to be to have no power, especially when you're Jewish. Okay? And so, for example, and I'm just reading two of 100, 200 stories, and you know, we have a copy here. You can get it yourself. Shvatim no roim she'ir l'magoroshim shochel efez. A terrible shvatim, uh, judgments. Those terrible incidents that happened to the Jews who just crossed over there into Morocco. You see where the Straits of Gibraltar are at the bottom over there. I've pointed out many times in this uh, series. There is a Gibraltar, there's Morocco already, you know. So obviously many Jews say, I'm going to go here. It can't get easier than that. But it's not so simple. Osam Shahokul of Fez, those who tried to go to Fez, which is the capital of Morocco, over a lamb Shvatavizbar. Upon them passed God's judgment. The terrible famine. The inhabitants of the towns and villages, the Arabs over there, would not let any of the refugees in because they'll drive up the price of food, which is true. We forget that. It's a fact. It's not like today in America where unlimited, thank God, the unlimited supply of food, you know, if a ton of new people show up and they, let's say tomorrow morning they bought out the giants, in 24 hours it gets replenished. And it wasn't like that. The Asu, the Sados, Oholim. And therefore, the Jewish refugees had to set up their tents outside the cities in fields. For Yeroh, Mishri, Son, they had the grass. For Avayimsu, the grass is the lucky ones found grass. Kimerov, Yovish, and Deja. It's Morocco, it was hot. It was the summer. It was July. It was August, actually. There's no uh, grass. Levad, not Mikri, some except some roots. Umesu, Shamba, Son, Amra, Ben, Kover. Huge numbers perished there from famine, and were never buried. Right? Uh, but those who didn't die had no kayach to bury anybody. Some of them were so from that, you know, when Saturday came, you, you, you got to eat grass to live. So, I mean, you, you pulled the grass out to eat it. And uh, that's one of the 39 malachas. So you'll tell me like this, who's thinking about that at that time? So the from was that they... You know, bit the grass out like that, do with the shinui. You know what I'm saying? The only, they, they would comfort themselves that at least they don't have to do this. So, uh, this, wait a minute. Uh, and there happened an the incidents, the like of which had never been heard. An Arab showed up. He saw a Jewish girl among these uh, people in, in trouble. And he raped her right in front of the mother and father. What could he do? Wait a minute. He showed up a half hour later, and took a spear and killed her, stabbed her. The, the, the Jews said, Hey, Achzer, you Achzer, you cruel, what would what, you do that for? You already had your way. And he said, I don't, I don't want to leave a Jewish child. I mean, this is the, what happens when you're exposed to, to, to helplessness. Has anything ever been heard before? A poor woman saw her son faint. And she had nothing to eat. And, and uh, she knew the, 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 the child was going to die. So she killed the child with a stone, threw a stone on his own head. And then she whacked her own head so she killed herself. Those people were driven. And this is one piece. I'm not here to horrify you if I was doing that. I read page after page of this. There's, uh, this, is, this is one piece of you know, a book. You understand? Uh, the sort of things that happened uh, there because it was really tough. The lucky ones, right, who got lucky, were able to get boats and go all the way to the other side of the Mediterranean to the Turkish Empire. There, the Sultan of Turkey, the Sultan Bayezid, for his own reasons, wanted the Jews of Spain to come in because, first of all, they were economically good, and second of all, they included uh, people with... with um, Knowledge of modern weaponry called cannon. Apparently, Jews got into any kind of business that was new. You know, that's always there. Jews, for example, today in the computer business and things of this nature, high tech. And so, high tech in the late 1400s was this new invention called a cannon. And the Turkish army wanted that, and, that's, and, and that, that is what happened. 
His factors, it's supposed to be that he said, how can you call Ferdinand a wise king when he impoverishes his own kingdom and enriches mine? But on the other hand, Ferdinand had his agenda, and I can assure you, Spain had its golden age as a world power in the century from 1492 to 1592. They didn't really suffer uh, from, from kicking the Jews out. There is a staple of Jewish historiography where Jewish historians always say, oh, Spain hurt themselves by kicking the Jews out, and you and I have heard that since we were kids. You can make that argument, but it's also true you can make a different argument, which is Spain actually had its glory years afterwards. So it took them a long time to feel the pain of 1492. I will conclude this series uh, with, with one final story over here. I think it's the most famous story from the Shevi Yehud. It's often recorded among those that know, and, uh, and it speaks to the mindset of the Jews who left in 1492 um, and, and, and what they were like. It says over here, Shemaitim Yehud, 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 I heard it from elderly people who left Spain, Ki Ani Achaz Ba Makas Hadever, that there was a ship carrying people away, and it got a, a, a plague on it, you know, Ill, uh, a, a, a medical plague. And so the captain of the ship threw off all the Jews on the nearest island. And most of them died of hunger. And some said, you know, they were dying of hunger on, on, on the beach, and, and some just said, let's just walk until we find a, an inhabited place. You know, listen, you can either die here or, or try your luck. So that, uh, it's, it's August in the Mediterranean, you know, it's, 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 it's terrible. Among them was a Jew, his wife, and two kids. His amtsu, they mechazik themselves with their last strength that they're going to try to walk to some place, wherever it is. They don't know where it is. For Isha, Mashal, and Kafragan, and Salfa Mesa, the woman who had been brought up uh, very refined and dainty, she came from a well-to-do, well, like we would say today, a fine image box. She wasn't used to this kind of hardship, and she just eventually, from the sun, passed out and died. For each, you know, see, I bought him, and so he picked up the two little kids, that's what it was, and he's carrying them in this heat. who, and he passes out because of the sun. They, they all, him and the two little kids pass out from the heat and famine. And when he woke up from his Fainting spell, both kids were dead. Uh, and he was so seized with uh, daiga, uh, with emotion here, he got up and he screamed to God. You're doing your best to get me to change my religion. I mean, you're hitting me with everything there is. I'm, I'm warning you, I'm telling you right now. He says, I'm going to be a Jew. I don't care what you do to me. You can throw your best at me. He says, I was a Jew and I will remain a Jew. And nothing you do and nothing you will do will get me to change. He gathered some sand and some grass. And he covered the two dead boys like that. And he proceeded forward and, and, and eventually found uh, sustenance. He found the Yeshiv. Yeah. Uh, that's, what it, that, that's the kind of mindset uh, it takes for people to make uh, what you call Sephardi to whore, to make that kind of uh, choice. Uh, that's the kind of mindset. It's superhuman. You know, it, 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 it sort of uh, boggles the, the mind. And it, it goes to show you what I uh, said before that the, the, one of the great crises of Jewish history uh, brought out the worst and, and the best in our people. It brought out uh, the greatest weaknesses and, uh, and the greatest strengths. Are there any questions? We'll take three questions. And any, fingers in, any fingers on the number of uh, conversos there were? The trouble is there are all kind of figures. That's the problem. Some say with a half a million, some say 200,000, some say with 50,000, you know, that's the problem. Percentage basis of the whole Spanish population? There were 10 million people in Spain. And how, what percentage of the... Uh, maybe, uh, maybe half a million, maybe. You know, that's a, that's a high number. Yeah, so it's, it's not a huge portion of the population, but it's not a tiny minority either. That, that's the problem. Is there, um, do you think, think any correlation between the, the atheism that started up in the, in the early 1400s, mid-1400s, 
Um, is, is there any correlation with between that and the uh, the Protestant Revolution, um, the the Reformation? No, you can't. Uh, yeah, that's a very intriguing question. I'm sure there are people writing dissertations on that at this moment. Uh, but I don't think so, because it was really confined to Spain, and, and, it, and, and it was, remember, uh, maybe you don't know, the Protestant Reformation was not atheist at all. The Protestant Reformation said the Catholics are not from enough. <laughs> the Pope is corrupt, you understand? The Cardinals have, mi have missed, uh, you know, directed religion. Martin Luther and these guys were, in their minds, firmer by far uh, than, than, than y y y you see what I'm saying? So uh, the kind of skepticism uh, that, uh, you know, that the Moranos were uh, displaying was the reverse of that. I'll take four questions. Yeah, I have a question. Um, King of America, smart fellow, had an agenda to make Spain all Catholic. Could you touch on something a little bit different? He's a smart fellow. The people were poor. Which people were poor? The Jews, the, the Catholics. I didn't say that. No, no, no I'm not saying. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying. After 1492, I understand. <coughs> churches were built, uh, cathedrals were built, palaces were built. So could he have another agenda that says, look, the Jews have tons of dough. It's an easy way to get rid of the Jews. It's a very convenient way to get rid of the Jews. You kick them out. You leave the gold and the silver there. That, 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 yeah, yeah, but what's the? I understand that argument. But what's the problem with it? A smart guy doesn't do that if he's talking economics. You don't kill your golden goose. You understand what I'm saying? You don't rob. Your, uh, the, the government can always rob the banks today, but there'll be nothing there tomorrow. Why did he do it? Why did he do it? I don't. Yes, so I'm trying to say, I don't think it'd be the easiest thing in the world to be cynical and say it's all economics. I really don't think that that was what it was about. Economically, he would have done better with the Jews being there and always being able to be milked. You see what I'm saying? This is sort of counterproductive. Machiavelli suggests a little bit of what you said. He said, look how clever Ferdinand is. He got all that money and things. But it's really not true. They would have done economically much better uh, by keeping a class of people which included all kinds of intelligent entrepreneurs and capitalists and investors in new technologies, which the Jews were. You understand? What you going to do to it? Uh, Portugal did it five years later. It's not true. They did it. Well, but then they kicked the Jews out also. They, they could have kept the Jews too, right? I, 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 there is another part about Port Portugal, but we know, we're out of time. Yeah, but, 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 but the short story is some Jews ran away to Portugal. The kings of Portugal were going to be money-driven and leave them alone. But then the Portuguese prince marries the daughter of Ferdinand Isabella. Mm -hmm. There we go. There you go. What happened to, what about the remnant of the Moors that... I said, okay, so as part of the, of, of the conquest of Granada, Fernand and Isabella promised to leave them alone. And they did, okay? Because uh, one of the things they didn't want to do was, was uh, stir up a huge Muslim uh, counter-reaction and have a reinvasion of Spain. But uh, in 1560s, when Spain was super-duper powerful and Philip II was the king of Spain, uh, they did it. They went after the Moors and they had a little war and they, and they either forcibly, they did the same thing, they either forcibly converted them or the ones that stood on Wednesday Muslims were kicked out. But being Muslims, they could go to their own countries, you know, they could go to Morocco and Algeria and be absorbed in there. But, but by the 1570s, uh, all Jews and Moors had either been converted or expelled. You see? How was it that uh, there were other expulsions all over Europe uh, hundreds of years earlier, uh, and, and in Spain somehow they seemed to survive until <laughs> Because in the other countries there were very, very small numbers of Jews who were n nowhere near as important to the economy. Uh, I mean, in Spain there were huge numbers of Jews. In England, in, in England there were tiny numbers of Jews. And in France, there were a substantial number of Jews, but the French kings were uh, super duper 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 anti Semitic, right? And uh, their anti Semitism trumped their economic self interest. That's, that's really what happened, starting from Philip II. But that's a whole separate schmooze. But I just gave you the one minute answer. What is it? Was there any, uh, among the, uh, when the Jews were expelled from Spain, were there any start or murmurs of an idea that maybe this is the end of all the Gaulis? Absolutely. I mean, I, 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 yes. And uh, I didn't have time to do it. Let, let, me, let me devote 60 seconds to that. And that is, Dear Barbanel was one of those who left Spain. Um, he wrote about it in great detail. We're not sure about all the, some we have from him, but he wrote about it in great detail. 
And uh, ever since, and he lived another 15 years, he died in 1507. And uh, he was absolutely convinced that this is the Mashiach time. And he wrote his commentary in the book of Daniel, which predicts the Mashiach times. And the Ikvits of Mashiach, the travails. What does it say in the book of Daniel? That, uh, you know, the righteous will be cut down, and then they'll be cut down even again, and they'll be refined to a tiny little group of true believers. He said, well, that's us, you know. And, and, he, and he applies, read the Abarbanel uh, on the Tochacha. When it says, in the morning you'll say, I wish it was evening, and vice versa, and you'll be running away from a driven leaf, and, uh, you know, you'll eat your children, and all this. And he says, well, this is it. You know, this is us. And so the Abarbanel was convinced that in the early 1500s is coming the Mashiach. He himself was able to leave and go to Italy. Uh, he had a relative or two that was kidnapped by the church and was not permitted to leave and was raised as a Catholic. Um, he felt this sort of thing in there. The Barbano was one of the three leading Jews at court. The other two Jews at court converted. The Barbano is famous for, for not converting, even though he was given inducements to do so. Um, so it's hard, you, know, you see what I'm saying? It's hard to do, but, but you're at, of course, the Barbano represents those large numbers of Jews who were convinced that this catastrophe is so great it can only be in the time of Mashiach. There are those who argue that this attitude remained among the Sephardim for a century, and it has to do with the rise of Kabbalah in Israel and Tzfas and things of this nature. I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't choose to pursue that uh, topic. To to yes, yes. Starting in 1492, a number of Sephardic Jews do move to Israel. The Bartanur had just set up a yeshiva to him, from Italy, and, that, and with the uh, expulsion of Jews of Spain, becomes the modern state of Israel. In other words, the current uh, we talked about this in the summer, the, the, uh, last winter, the current Jewish community in Israel pretty much dates from 1492. Not that a lot came then, but it's the beginning of Jews coming in any kind of serious numbers, but it's, it's very, very small at that time. Could you touch on Torquemada? Just 30 seconds. Okay, Torquemada is nothing but, I mean, there's all kinds of rumors about him, but Torquemada was nothing but the d dedicated leader of the Inquisition who pushed this, you understand? Uh, he, listen, I want to tell you something. He wasn't wrong. Uh, as we've seen over here, what the kings and queens of Spain say in their decree of expulsion makes a lot of sense. Uh, they're doing Kirov, they're sending Chomashim, they're sending them Koshami, they're inviting them to weddings. Uh, you understand where they're coming from. You, you see what I'm saying? He was a Catholic priest. There are so to say he's descended from Jews, but it doesn't matter. You know, if I told you Hitler was a descendant from Jews, who knows? Who knows? Who knows? who your grandfather was 10 generations ago, especially in Spain or thing, you know, the, 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 it was a, the, the, the Goths, the Vizimor, the, 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 the Moors, or, you know, who knows where he comes from. Torquemada was simply the head of the Inquisition, and, and he did a doggone good job of organizing it, unfortunately. All right. There's one last point. Jonathan, you wanted something? Were any Christian Christians swept up by the Inquisition? Yes. All the way through, down until its, it's abolition in the early 1800s, there were plenty of Christian Christians who were stuck in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, you, you, long before Kafka, you had many Kafka-esque situations as a result of the Inquisition. Because somebody could be, uh, think about the following, 1750, they're going to burn people to stake. 1750 is like 400 years after the <laughs> conversions. And so somebody, they, they're keeping records of you that you're Jewish. You don't even know you're Jewish. And so the guy might say like this, I like classroom music, <laughs> you know, something like that. So, you know, some stupid thing like this. Or uh, uh, it might be Pesach. He never even heard of Pesach. And he said, uh, I'm not interested in this. Somehow I have a bread intolerance this week or something like that. Swept the Inquisition, put him in the torture room. He'll confess to everything. He'll say he's a Satmar Chazi. He'll do whatever he do. And, and he'll get burned to the stake. Even though, uh, as you indicate, uh, he wasn't Jewish. I mean, except in the most uh, remote sense.